me ask you the first question of the day. That is, why are you scared of exams? The word itself is so scary. <laughs> And like I said, the peer pressure from families and teachers. There's a lot God of pressure. Go. God is going. Yeah. You, the first thing people actually ask you when you're out of your, your graduation is done or your credit board or peer board is done, is how much do you get? And this, if they, as soon as they hear something below like 80 or something like that, like, oh my God, what is your son going to do next? Is he, uh, is he planning to do arts or is he planning to do something way beyond and below that? So, I mean, I mean to say it's like marks actually matter a lot. And um, what else? Yeah, also the fear of uncles and aunts uh, coming over oh, and asking how much you've got, what are you going to do next? Do you think that if a person has got 90% or uh, in a stand or uh, any, any exam, uh, do you think that if they are taking up science, does it make them smarter than a person who is taking up arts or someone who is taking up commerce? Okay. Uh, in the perspective of the society, they think it does. But as a student, strictly speaking, they just want to. It just not, doesn't matter. Yeah, because you, get 90, you, you take know, arts and commerce only after you finish your schooling. It's not that. Yeah, it's going to be like a totally different subject to your learning. Yeah. So you would stand out different than. But people yeah. around will actually think if you take if you got 90% plus, you have to do science and you are like a genius. Yeah, that, that's I think the reason is people are under the impression that. Arts and commerce is not difficult because science is something we're all familiar with. Uh, if we see the equations in science, it does care. And no one publicizes something like accounting or statistics. And arts also is a little tough subject if you consider uh, topics like geography and psychology. A lot of people struggle in that. Uh, there is always something that I've been wondering. I heard the story where people say that Indian parents are a lot like uh, a herd of elephants. They don't allow the young one to go beyond a few feet from the herd. Uh, that's something that I see with Indian parents. They don't allow, allow their kid to do something more than what they're actually capable of. They restrict them to uh, something. Why do you think that they are so conservative? Firstly, like I said, the hereditary problem that kept on coming from generations. They don't like to see other people and their words, how they live a life. It's just about, it, it's just about you and your family, always. They stop you from doing everything you want. Um, I think, yeah, I agree with them saying that like, the, most of the families are not so conservative because it's happened to them. Like, by then, it's happened to them as well. So they think like this will be the safest path. I mean, what they think will be the safest path will be the safest path. My child will do no more than a path than that. So we'll be pretty cool with it. But they don't, they don't, they don't realize the fact that um, if you don't allow them to experience something new or what he wants to do, at the end of the day, he's just going to be another person, another person that you know, so, yeah. in the crowd. Yeah. Would you agree if I said that Indian parents expect you to master something rather than experiencing a variety of things? Master something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah see, uh, my case, my family has a family business. So, all they want me to do is ask me how to work, come down, sit in the shop, do, do all the working, like say and sell jewelry to people, master that because at the end of, uh, after some time, after the degree is over, I'm going to come back and work there. So they actually, my case, when I was like from 8 to 8, like I was when, eight year, when I was 8 years old, from that time they told me to come, they tell me to come to the shop and take care of the shop. Like, you're going to, uh, after some time, you're going to do this, right? So from now on, you said, learn how to count us, big <laughs> They know it's all that. So the same case is with me. When I wanted to do CA, my mom said, do only CA, concentrate on only CA. Later I thought, why to waste time and let me go join a music class or a painting class where my mom is. But she's like, no, first concentrate on this, complete it, master it completely, and then you can do what you want. So in India, it's a lot like life is something that you need to master and not something that you need to experience. experience. Because experience involves the risk. <laughs> they don't see this. Okay.
Now, I'm someone who always believes in learning through trial and error. I say that because I've never really sat through classroom sessions and learned something from teachers on stage. I've always been someone who's going out exploring stuff and learning from people. That's the way I've been learning things. So do you feel that trial and error is the ideal way for someone to learn rather than a classroom session? I mean, classroom sessions are okay in some cases. Like in the world of medicine, if you're doing MBBS, you always have to learn it in the classroom before you implement it practically. But in other cases, say in the world of management, the world of arts, the world of commerce, do you feel that it's better off to learn through plan and error most of the concepts that we see in textbooks than in the classroom session? Yeah, like you said, uh, trial and error is the best way of learning something because you just go about discovering stuff and when it's wrong, you keep it aside and try the new stuff. You're yeah. able to correct your mistakes better in plan. Yeah. yeah, and you're able to remember what error you did. But when, when it is a stepwise procedure of learning, you're not able to do that because you'll have to think what was the first step you learned. The, the number of mistakes you make in step by step in the classroom is less. So you, you really fail to look at the mistake there. Yeah, so like things like, I mean, you take an example like uh, sending a particular thing. You can't go up to a person and tell him like, you touch, do this to this, uh, this stuff you send, you go to a person and do this. This is not going to happen. It's over time you learn how to do it. Like for example, coming up to on the, coming up on the dais and speaking something. You can't teach something. You can tell a person like, how this is how it's done. And this is how you're going to communicate. But when he comes right on the dais, everything in his head goes out. And he actually learns how to do it. Like, learn how to uh, speak properly by doing it two, three times, or like over and over again. The first time he might just not be able to uh, connect it to the people. He might have, like me, I'm scattered like, in my thoughts. I, I, I have no, I'm, I have absolutely no idea to speak. My first video. So, with time, when I, the number of videos increases, or like when I get close and comfortable with the camera, I think I'm able to, I think I'm able to speak better. And then this style that I'm learning is like the best one. You can't teach me how to speak. <laughs> Well said, well said. I think that's one of the most interesting points. Uh, the upcoming videos, you will be much less nervous than what you are right now. So I can see that you guys are nervous. So let me close the session for today. I am celebrating. I am celebrating your 100th I am celebrating my 100th video. Thank you guys for being part of this. I should be able to publish this in a few days. You guys will see, will see yourself as mini YouTube celebrities. Thank you guys. See you. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.